So thanks everyone for making the time to attend this um, short workshop or or quite a short session because it's just an hour long. Um, so I'm Dr. Torella Ike and I'm a senior lecturer at Teesside University UK. And um, as part of my expertise and subject area that I teach in, I teach on research methods as well as um, complex methodologies and social research methods. Okay. So today's training, or what I call it a brief workshop, is um, based on methodologies in international relations and some of the ways in which we can do systematic reviews to enhance some of the already good work we're already doing within the context of this field. Um, so just to say, uh, when it comes to the systematic review, so because it's a very short session of one hour, I'm not claiming to give you all of the tips and get you running straight away with just a one hour session, because normally I would deliver the session for like half a day or a full day minimum. But what I'm hoping that you would get out of the session is the key knowledge to be able to be Thank you. Is a key knowledge to be able to actually think about and start preparing to do a systematic review. So you're not like overwhelmed with, is it that difficult? Because I believe anyone can do a systematic review if they really want to do it. Okay, so I've been involved in a number of systematic reviews. Um, some of the reviews, as you can see on my screen, in which I am lead author and others, a lot of others, where I um, am part of the teams that conduct systematic review, not just within the context of the IRO discipline as well as criminology, but also within the health sector um, systematic reviews that has been conducted. And the reason why is because I'm a type of researcher that tends to adopt an interdisciplinary approach to enhance the, the, the field of international relations. So if you Google my name, you'll see that I've got other systematic reviews in areas that are not necessarily in criminology or international relations, as the case may be. Okay, so in terms of the outline, um, I'll start off with the context, an introduction to what exactly is a systematic review. Why do we even bother to engage in conducting one in the first place? Or why are we not just doing the same reviews we've been doing over and over again for our different type of research, be it critical discourse analysis, be it narrative analysis, thematic analysis, and all of that that is quite prevalent in the field of international relations. So I'll start by setting out the context of why systematic reviews are important and what they bring to the field in terms of our knowledge, our understanding, and also informing policy. And I would also be looking at some of the key stages of conducting a, uh, a systematic review. So what does it involve? How is it different from the usual type of review that we conduct in, let's say, our PhD project, in, let's say, our journal articles that or manuscript that we draft? How is it different? And what are some of the process we need to get into to be able to conduct a robust systematic review? And then we'd also look at the protocol, which for me, it's a really, really important component of a systematic review. What is the protocol? How do you design a protocol? And what are some of the key information that needs to be on the protocol to be able to produ uh, produce an evidence-based systematic review? And then there will be conclusion as well as, um, I hope to finish within 45 minutes, so I'll allow for a space for question and answer as um, we proceed. But if you've got any question before then, please pop them on the chat box or raise your hands and, um, I don't know, Cassie, if you're, still, you're there, you can let me know so I'll be able to answer them as we as we go. Thank yes, you. Yes, of course. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so in terms of the context, it is no doubt that as academics, there's this wide phrase of, um, of infamous phrase that is often been used, publish or perish and that sort of thing, which um, it's got its pros and cons to it, but I would like to dwell on the positive. So what that's have done is that we now have widespread publications on a yearly basis. So I was looking at the Taylor and Francis um, uh, website, I think two weeks ago, just to see the number of publications that they did on a yearly basis. And approximately 2,700 journal articles are published yearly. That's just for Taylor and Francis. So what about Wiley? 
I've not even looked at SAGE, or talked about SAGE and other um, Oxford uh, University Press and other uh, major publishers. But if you even look at widely, they, they publish around 1,500 on a yearly basis. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there is a range of literature and very good research that are currently being published on a yearly basis. And it would take, I would say, millions of years to be able to read or keep abreast with all of this publication if you were to read every single one. It's literally not possible. And this is why it becomes important, especially when it comes to policymakers. With all of this research out, the, out there, policymaker might not necessarily have the time to skim through all of the single research to get a sense of the key message that they're trying to pass on, or to get a sense of, for example, the interventions that work or what doesn't work. So what does that actually mean for us as researchers when we think about it? So not just for policymakers, but also for ourselves as researchers when we are trying to delve into a topic to try to understand not just the context of the topic, but the gaps that remain, and also what those existing studies are telling us that we need to take forward in terms of our respective discipline. And that is where the systematic review comes in when you think about it. Because um, think of a systematic review as a type of review that gives you insight into all of this thousands of research that are out there for you to select the best piece of research that answers your research question in a systematic order. So again, I like the definition that was given by Oman um, in his um, article when he was trying to talk about what a systematic review is. And that particular article, um, during your spare time, I'd encourage you to read it, um, talk about the fact that when we think about systematic review, it's more of that detailed comprehensive plan and what that means is that you having that plan of the proposed topic you're trying to address and how you're going to address it in the sense that you have an a priori uh, sort of um, what would be referred to as a protocol in the next couple of, of slides. What that then helps you to do is that from the onset, you have that sort of blueprint of the specific topic you're going to address, the research that you're going to address and the research question, as well as some inclusion and exclusion criteria in terms of the quality assessment of each of the piece of work that you're going to include in the review. So from that sense, what the systematic review does is that it not just provide that a priori template within which you conduct a very thorough and robust review, it also helps to reduce bias. And again, if you look at the thousands of literatures that are out there, there is this research bias, which is quite normal because it's practically not possible to include all of the literature in one's work. So there's that sense of selective um, approach to conducting literature review. And um, as I will talk about in the next um, slide about why we need to go beyond the traditional narrative review, you would find that um, when you think about the traditional narrative reviews, which is quite common, in our manuscripts, be it in our thesis or in our whatever type of writing we are doing, whilst these are also very important in that they contribute to the body of knowledge in one form or the other, but they've got their own limitations as well. So for example, there is selective citations of literature. And in fact, during the course of conducting systematic review, what I've tend to find out is in some of the articles that we actually select for our studies, at the end of the day, we might have to drop them down because a lot of the times they, they're quite biased in terms of what they include in those studies and what they omit or choose not to include. So all of those things, it's, it, it's something that needs to be taken into consideration when it comes to the traditional forms of literature review. And another thing about it is that it is very, very hard to replicate. So for example, if you pick up a typical manuscript or a, a, a typical article in a journal that purports to use maybe, for example, thematic analysis and all of that, if you read the literature review session, you find it really hard to know where exactly does this author get the piece of work that they rely on for their studies? What sort of database did they rely on to inform the works that they are doing? 
or what sort of literature or search term did they use to select the literature in such a way that is devoid of bias? It is literally very, very hard for you to get that in a typical manuscript. Of course, in the methodology section, they might tell you about how they collected the data and all of that. But in the literature review session, which I think is really, really important to set the context of any given research, you rarely find all of those criteria, which means that it could be prone to bias, given that they might decide to select some studies and or, you know, ignore other studies based on the scope of what they're trying to do. And not just that, um, there's also the issue of difficulty in replication. So for example, if you're looking at specific area of topic, let's say it could be um, interventions or military interventions in a given type of scenarios, and you pick up um, literatures from that area, given that there is no clear um, section that tells you how this literature came about, it becomes very, very hard for you to replicate what that specific author is doing. And I found that a number of times in my area of research, because I tend to conduct randomized control trials, I had to email some of the authors to say, please, where did you find this literature? How can I get access to it? Because it was never talked about in terms of where they got the literature from, what type of search term they used, and all of that. So replication becomes extremely difficult in that um, context. And then um, there's also um, the implication of the difficulty of separating the research evidence from what is often perceived as anecdota, because a lot of the times, if we're not so clear where they're getting their literature from in terms of the database you're searching, where they've looked at and where they haven't looked at, it's quite difficult to differentiate between the research evidence that they've got and what is often perceived as anecdota, because we might not even know if they're including all of the key studies in that specific article in the first place. So all of these reasons does, um, in a sense, give a strong rationale as to why we need to go beyond traditional narrative reviews. And again, I normally tell my PhD student, in fact, before they start into the actual project, I always encourage them to start with a preliminary systematic review to have a sense of all of the literature. And the reason I do that is not because I, I want to put pressure on them to, to study everything in that area, but it's be just because I want to make sure they're including all of the relevant piece of work without being biased and being selective of what they will include in their study. And I want them to be able to have that sense of um, uh, replication in terms of how did they arrive at the current pages of research they're trying to do and what is the strong rationale from based on the literature that gives them the, 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 the credence to, to pursue the work that they're already doing. So it's a good way to move beyond the traditional narrative reviews that we have to a more systematic approach to doing a literature review. And if you even look at the, the whole hierarchy of research in terms of reviews and just research in general, you would say that systematic review is among um, one of the highest points of the pyramid. So apart from mental analysis, which is a more complex type of um, review because it's more, um, in a sense, quantitative in nature, systematic review is the next after that specific order. You would see that randomized control trial, non-randomized control trial, all of them that goes below the systematic review, which tells you how really important it is within the context of the um, overall review. But that's not to say that's the only type of review. So for example, we have other types of uh, review. We have the rapid evidence assessment. We have the scoping review, which is also very good, but they are not as robust and methodologically sound like the systematic review, but they are also very good in their own um, rights as well. Okay, so um, having set that context, I know one of the key questions would then be, so why is the systematic review important? One of the things that I would say is that systematic review is important because when you engage in it, what it does help you to do is that it helps you become the subject experts in that area. And I'm talking from my own personal experience. So my research revolves around um, terrorism, counterterrorism, and also the reintegration of complex offenders. So those that were once uh, members of prescribed terrorist groups 
that have now undergone de-radicalization? How do we reintegrate them back into society without them relapsing back to crime? So that's the type of research that I looked at. So I tend to you do more of a randomized control trial, but before I even proceed to do those ROCTs, I need to understand the context of the literature in terms of what people have already done in the past, what works, what doesn't work, and how can I build on the very brilliant work that other scholars have done in the past. And one of the ways that I can do that from a non-biased perspective is through a systematic review. So what has have helped me done across the years is that it has given me that sound knowledge of my subject area. So I could literally tell you of heart how many arrow cities have been published in the last um, two months as it relates to the reintegration of complex offenders like former Boko Haram members, as the case may be, because I've so much read the literature, be so engrossed in it, published a number of systematic reviews on it that I can tell you the key studies and the gaps that are in that area. So it's sort of gives you that subject expertise in the specific area that you're looking at, because then you look at the majority of the literature in that area from a global perspective, and you become familiar with the methods that have been used within that context of the discipline. You become familiar with the type of interventions that have been done, the key findings, and then from there, you can proceed to build on those um, findings to be able to design your own intervention, which is why it's good. And then also importantly, it provides an evidence-based um, rationale for one to be able to inform policymakers. So like I said, again, relating it back to the previous um, slide where I sort of showed the number of um, papers that are published on a yearly basis, it will be quite hard for a policymaker, of course, they do put out funding calls for things like that, for systematic reviews and rapid evidence assessments. But it would be quite hard for them to have the time to look at all of those thousands of papers that are published on a yearly basis. So what the systematic review does is that through that robust synthesis, it could be a synthesis for the last 10 years, it could be a synthesis for the last 50 years of all of the literature in a given area. What the systematic review does is that it gives them the best of the best in terms of that research area to so say, based on the review that we have done, this is what we, we found. So, for example, having um, reviewed 2,500 studies, only 50 met the inclusion criteria, and this is what those 50 studies are saying. So that gives um, policymaker a clear sense of um, in terms of um, information to inform your policy based on a robust approach. So it's really, really useful from a policy perspective uh, when, you, when you think about it. And also it's a transparent approach, given that you can replicate it. Because why? How the studies came about in terms of them meeting the inclusion criteria have been clearly spelled out in the protocol. So everyone is quite aware that this is how you arrive at the studies that are now informing the recommendations that you're making. So I could also go to those database, conduct the same search that you search and arrive at a similar type of uh, findings that you've got, So which is good. So that even builds in more trust to the recommendations that you would make as a result of a systematic review as compared to just a mere scoping review, if you get what I mean. So it's it's it, that transparency there is something that is really, really credible and very worthwhile about systematic review approach. And then it helps reduce bias because unlike the traditional literature review, where the author is at liberty to choose what literature they would include in their, in their manuscript and what literature they would not include, with systematic review, the way it's designed is in such a way that that selective bias is removed, where, for example, you can include as much studies as possible that meets your inclusion criteria. And that's why a lot of the time with systematic review, it's rare to find one person doing it since I've been doing systematic review. The minimum I've seen is two people. So it's, it's, it's made up of a team. So for example, in my own team, when I do my systematic review, I have a librarian as part of the team. I have, if it's a quantitative systematic review, we even have a statistician that does the quantitative bits. If it's a purely qualitative one, which is where, of course, we've got that expertise, 
we usually around three, four, five, six, seven, sometimes 15 during the systematic review. So that, in a, in, in a sense, reduced the level of bias significantly because you're having different pair of eyes looking at the study at the same time. So giving it that sense of um, transparency and less bias in terms of uh, the studies you're including or the ones you choose not to include whilst also giving reasons why you're not including those studies. And also um, another reason why systematic review is important is because it is exhaustive. So you're searching diverse database. So for example, you're not just looking at one specific database. You might be looking at EBSCO, you might be looking at Web of Science, you might be looking at the International Bibliography of the Social Sciences. So you're looking at a whole wide range of database. So you're not just confined to one specific database. And what that does is that it allows you to be exhaustive as much as possible. And again, that goes back to reducing the level of bias. You look at gray literature, for example, if that's part of your inclusion criteria. You also look at other things like uh, maybe um, hand session of libraries and um, uh, the, the, the reference list of published texts and things like that. So it makes it very, very exhaustive in terms of how you source for the literatures and the studies that would end up being part of your uh, final review. So I've talked about transparency in the past and then um, it also provides that criteria for choosing studies. So what were the criteria that you initially decide to set, to set as to the studies that you're going to be including in your actual piece of review? So because that criteria is part of the published protocol and also part of the published review, it becomes easy for anyone reading that piece of review to say, actually, this is not biased because they've clearly stated the criteria within which they would include studies. And they've also clearly stated the criteria in which they would exclude studies. So for example, uh, in one of the review that I did, so in that specific um, review, I was looking at interventions that were used, used to encourage the reintegration of former proscribed members of terrorist group. And what that um, criteria does is that in designing that specific systematic review, I clearly, or my team, we clearly indicated that we're not going to include any studies that does not relate to proscribed terrorist groups. So from the onset, we are clear that we are looking at those type of complex offenders. So if anyone picks up that review and looks at it and say, how come we're not inc including those that commit things like robbery, for instance, it is already clear from the review that this is the population we are focusing on. And that, um, in a sense, gives us a credibility as to why we are excluding other types of offenders and including just those that we are once um, affiliated to terrorist group. So that sort of criteria gives credibility and transparency in terms of conducting the review. Okay, so um, the next stage, in relation to the um, conducting of a systematic review is, I, I tend to subsume them into 10 steps. So these stages or steps, if you want to call them that as well, is, so again, it's not linear in itself because sometimes I know the first two are linear in, in that you first need to think about your preliminary title and initial question before you even proceed to design the protocol. So those first two are linear, but, in the actual sense, in a real life context, you find that you can move between stage six and five or stage five and four as you proceed. So for some team, they might decide to get all of the papers first before they start engaging in data extraction. But for others, they can do, um, if they see the paper that meets their inclusion criteria, they can extract the data as they go. So it all depends on what works for your team or what, what you feel is most appropriate for you. But the most important thing is that these major stages are crucial to conducting a systematic review. So the first stage essentially is the preliminary title. And I will be talking about that in much more detail in the next couple of slides. And what the preliminary title helps you do is that it gives you a sense of um, how to actually start the review in the first place. So it's a tentative title, meaning it's subject to change. 
And the idea behind that is for you to start an initial scoping review. So is what you're proposing to do been already done? So that's what that initial title helps you with. And it also helps you in the formulation of the initial research question and the scope of, of in which the review would take. So it's really, really important. So I tend to start with that first before I even proceed to develop the protocol, because there is no point of uh, spending hours and hours and hours developing a protocol, only for you to find that, that what you're trying to do have already been done before. As academics, we know that time is precious. So that stage one is really, really important. That's why I highlighted it. Okay. Then for the second stage, which is the development of the protocol, um, again, that's very, very important because if you don't get the protocol right, then there are high chances that the review will be flawed. So I would always encourage that when you're thinking about doing a systematic review, you invest a lot of time in developing the protocol because the protocol is that a priori, uh, a priori blueprints that you need to be able to actually carry out the review. It's the protocol that would indicate, for example, the inclusion criteria of the studies that you'll be relying on for the re review. It's also the protocol that would all be also contain information regarding your exclusion criteria, how you're going to synthesize the data, and also how you're going to write up the studies and all of that in terms of um, having completed the review. So it's really, really important to invest a lot more time in the protocol because once you get it right, then it becomes easy for you to conduct the review in a very seamless way. And again, what, what that would also help you do is to know if there's enough studies for you to even proceed to do a review. Because if there is no more studies, then there is no point doing the systematic review. So if you've not even got any studies on the topic, then systematic review might not be the best option because it's based on existing research that um, your review will be based upon. Okay, so the third stage is about conducting searches. Again, I will talk about this in much more depth. And then the fourth stage is about um, sifting the abstract and title. So from all those thousands of papers that you would see online or in your library or wherever the source of database that you're searching, how do you carry out that sifting to ensure that you're only carrying, you're only including the studies that meets your inclusion criteria. So there is a, there's an act rate in terms of how you scheme reads the abstract, the title, just to get a sense of whether or not it meets your inclusion criteria. And if so, the next stage of looking at the full paper in much more depth. And how do you record all of this? So that at the end of the review, you can be able to say, I've looked at maybe 10,000 research, 8,000 papers, and so far, only 40 meets my inclusion criteria. So how did you get to that number? And how did you condense it to the level that you've got? So for example, if I've looked at 5,000 paper, how did I condense it to 70? So all of these are things that need to be recorded accordingly when you're doing the um, systematic review. And then stage six, we're looking at data extraction. So that stage usually comes up after you've seen the papers that meet your inclusion criteria, and then you're taking out the key piece of data that is related to your research question. So remember, a lot of these papers or articles that have been published might not necessarily be focused on the type of research question that you're looking at. So you're, you're pretty much bringing different types of studies together, but that may have a central theme in relation to what you're looking for. So during the data extraction stage, it is not the stage where you just collect all of the information in the paper. It's just a stage where you pick specific aspects of that paper that are specific findings or results that are related to the research question that you've already pre-designed in your protocol. Okay, and then another important part is the quality assessment. So you conduct a quality assessment using a checklist for each specific paper. So having a look at the 10 checklists, which I'll talk about as well as we proceed, did that specific paper you included met all of the quality assessments? So this is why a systematic review again becomes much more robust than the conventional literature review or the traditional um, literature review. And then um, at stage eight, it's more of data synthesis. 
Uh, if you're having a review that contains both quantitative and qualitative studies or just qualitative studies, that's where you sort of synthesize all of the papers that meet your inclusion criteria to arrive at um, a specific um, findings. And then obviously the interpretation of the results at stage nine and then recommendation. Okay, so I'll look at the first stage in terms of um, preliminary title. So why is this important? And why is the initial question important? So um, it is important because one needs to be aware of what is already out there. And there are lots of databases that are, in fact, the, what they focus on is on the registration of systematic review. And what does help you do is that when you go to those, for example, if you go to Campbell Collaboration, where there is, they've got a database of registered systematic review, you can actually search based on the preliminary title that you've got to see whether there is an ongoing review in that specific area or whether there is a completed review in that area. And what that helps you do is that first it helps you refine your, your review. So if there's an ongoing review that is quite similar, then there is no point going ahead with the review unless you need to refine it to something else. Or alternatively, if there is no such review, then it gives you a blueprint to say, okay, I'm going to proceed with this review because having searched all of the database, there seems to be no current review looking at the specific topic or research question that I'm looking at. So it's a good way to um, have that sense of originality when you're starting your review to make sure someone else is not doing it. Because like I said, time is very precious for we as academics and it will not make sense for someone to start a review just to find out, half, find out halfway down the line that someone else or another team have already published similar review. So it's very, very important to um, do that preliminary title and search to make sure you're not um, wasting your time. Okay, so how do you do it? Um, that This is where scoping review comes in because with scoping review, it's, I would say it's another form of review, but it's not as robust as a systematic review. So what the scoping review helps you do is to first identify what reviews are out there, identify what literature are out there of studies that are potentially likely to meet your inclusion criteria. So like I said, there is no point in doing a systematic review if you haven't got studies that are likely to meet your inclusion criteria because there will just be nothing within which to base your review on. And that's why um, scoping review of preliminary titles, your initial research question, is very, very important as the very first stage before you commence the systematic review. And then um, in terms of the preliminary title, um, I would also encourage an initial question. And in order for you to design that question, again, in line with global best practice, it's encouraged to adopt the PICO model. So what that PICO model is, is that your, the question is encouraged to have a population of interest. The interventions that you're looking at, what are you comparing that intervention with and what are the key outcomes that you are pretty much trying to um, um, achieve as a result of it? So I'm going to show you an example of, um, of how this works in terms of drafting your research question. Because with this, what it does help you do is that it helps your review to be more focused because it will be practically impossible to include a, a, a given population, more than certain types of population, because it, it goes back to the issue of resources. How many resources um, um, staff have you got to be able to conduct that review? It goes back to the issue of time and how feasible it is for you to be able to conduct that specific review. So the PICO model is highly, highly important when um, designing your initial question. Okay, so here's an example of an initial question that I designed using the PICO model. So if you look at a question which reads, what are victims' experiences of the effectiveness of government reintegration program when compared to media orientation intervention, in encouraging former proscribed terrorist members successful reentry into society in West Africa. So if you were to break that question down using the PICO model, you would find that 
from the question, you can see clearly that it's got a population and the population relates to communities and victims of, it could be victims of terrorism, it could be victims of um, 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 disasters as the case may be as a result of terrorism. And then you can see clearly from that specific research question that there is an intervention that I, we are trying to see to know whether or not the intervention work. And that interventions relates to the government's reintegration programs. So meaning that any program that is not commissioned by the government will not be included in the systematic review. So from the onset, it is clear what our focus in, who our populations are and what we are comparing it with. So in terms of comparison, you could see that in this specific review, we are trying to compare the government's reintegration program to media orientation intervention to see which one works better. Because media orientation tends to be the what in the in the health um, sciences or call treatment as usual. But in social sciences, we tend to look at it as the alternative intervention that is widely available. So we're trying to compare these two type of intervention to see which one is more likely to have a positive impact or effectiveness in aiding reintegration of former terrorists into society. So by former terrorists, we're referring to terrorist members that have undergone government's de-radicalization program and are now certified as fit to get back into society. So you could see from this that we were clear about the population, which is the victims, the intervention, which is government reintegration program, what we're comparing that intervention with, which is the media orientation, and the outcome. So the outcome for us is the successful reentry into society. So we're going to be looking at any study or any or group of studies that focus on this specific research area. So if it's an intervention, that is not for former terrorists or the reintegration of former um, Boko Haram members or maybe proscribed terrorists into society, then definitely we're not going to include it in our studies. So from the onset, anyone saying this will be clear and know what the focus of our systematic review is and why we've decided not to include um, studies not falling within this specific um, example. So once we have decided the initial research question and the title, then the next stage, which for me is one of the most significant and important stage, is the protocol. So think about the protocol as the... So when you want to build a house, you typically have a plan. So think about the protocol as the plan before you actually start the foundation of your house. So if you think of it from that way, you begin to understand why it's important, because with that plan, you get to know, for example, how many blocks will go into the foundation, how many um, cements and all of that, or rods, as the case may be, would go into that building plan. So that's the same thing as a protocol. But what the protocol does is that it gives you a clear sense of what you're including, what you're excluding, how you're going to analyze the data, and some of the key um, search terms that you're going to be using to be able to get the studies that would meet your inclusion criteria. So um, again, when writing a protocol um, in the social sciences, just like in the health uh, related discipline as well, we are always encouraged to publish our protocol. So publish it in advance. And what that help you do is that it gives other intending authors that would want to research the same area to know that no, actually someone else is already working in this area because you don't want to spend like uh, six months to a year doing a robust systematic review when you've not published a protocol and then halfway down the line, someone else is already doing the same review. Of course, having a larger team than yourself published it and then you're like, all your efforts seem to have gone down the drain. So we, it's always encouraged to draft a protocol, get it ready, publish it in, it could be, for example, um, the Campbell collaboration. So if it's health related research, like the Prospero, as the case may be, to get that uh, protocol published so that anyone planning to do a systematic review when they go to search these protocols, uh, sorry, this databases, will be aware that you are already um, doing that type of review and would proceed to do something else rather than duplicating the efforts that you're already making. So it's encouraged to do that when um, doing your systematic review because that would also help minimize duplications of review because systematic review are, are, are quite resource intensive. 
time consuming and takes a lot of staff to do it, depending on the size of the review that you're doing. Okay. So um, in terms of the content of the protocol, so these are all of the contents that will be expected of a typical protocol. Um, some might vary slightly, but again, um, based on, on, on the Prospero, the Campbell collaboration and all of that, that been able to engage in, these are the typical items you would find in a review protocol. So the first is the title of the review, which I've already talked about, and then the background to the review. So the background is you just setting the context as to why that review is important. So for example, you've done an initial, an initial scoping review, and what you found is that based on the scoping review you've done, no other um, review in relation to your subject area seems to have been done. So it's you creating that sense of why is this important? Why is this re systematic review needed now? What? How does it differ from other existing systematic reviews that are out there? So that's just the background. And then the aims and objectives, or what is the key aims? What's the overall objective? So how do you intend to achieve the aims that you set out? And then the criteria for inclusion of studies. So again, if you recall, I talked about the PICO model as a way of designing your research question. So once you've designed the research question, it becomes easy for you to also design your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for example, given the previous example that I gave in relation to victims experiences of government reintegration programs, it becomes easy for me to know that my inclusion criteria would be only victims of terrorism. So my exclusion criteria then automatically becomes the fact that anyone that is not a victim would not be included in my study. So it's quite easy having clearly um, defined that in my research question. And then um, the criteria, like I said, again, what is not in your inclusion criteria automatically become something that will be considered your exclusion criteria. So exclusion criteria could also be in terms of the number of years. So you might say that um, for the purpose of your systematic review, you're only focusing on a specific time frame. So it could be from, let's say, um, the last 10 years, or uh, maybe you might be looking at only studies that have um, been published after the advent of COVID-19 and things like that. So there is no point reviewing studies before then. So you might set those exclusion criteria as a guideline as well. So for example, if your review is going to be focusing on articles that are published in the last 10 years, then your exclusion criteria could be any studies published after the, after the first 10 years will not be included in your study. So you're seeing that it aids replication because you've transparently said what is in your inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then the search method. So how are you going to conduct the search? What search terms are you using? So again, in conventional literature review, you will rarely find an author including a search term in their literature review session. They don't even talk about it, which makes it hard to replicate. But in a systematic review, it's always encouraged to include a section or like a paragraph where you tell us clearly what search term did you design to arrive at the studies that you get to? So we too can be able to replicate if need be. So it's, it's also um, very important. And then um, the methods of the reviews, as well as the quality assessment, I've, I've, I've touched on that um, previously. And then how are you going to extract the data? So what information are you collecting from the respective studies, as well as how you're going to present the results and the timeline for the review? So for some review, if you've got like um, a big team, you can get it done in six months. Um, for some, it could be a year, depending on the scale of the, the, the literature you're looking at. So if you're looking at the last 50 years, the, then obviously, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that. But if you're looking at the last 10 years, you might want to do it for six months or maybe depending on the team that you've got. So again, like I said, it's resource intensive if you're looking at it from a bigger and larger scale. Okay, so um, in terms of the third stage, it's about conducting sessions of all of the studies that meets your inclusion criteria. So now you've done the inclusion criteria, the third stage then becomes a stage where you test out this inclusion criteria based on the, the uh, conducting searches on the relevant database that um, you 
needs to look at. So what that then means is that you are pretty much avoiding selection bias by looking at as much database as possible. And um, so yes, an example of um, one of the systematic review I am currently working on with my team that gives you a clear sense of the inclusion criteria as well as the research question. So if you look at the, so this is available on the Prospero website. So you can always, um, during your spare time, have a read through. You would see that it contains the type of studies that needs to be included, as well as the type of studies that will be excluded. It also contains the PICO model in terms of the participants that will be included, the interventions, what we are comparing it with, and the key outcomes that we're looking for. It's also not just talk about that, but it clearly states the database that we're going to be searching to be able to retrieve studies that would meet this inclusion criteria. So for example, we said we're going to be looking at the web of science as um, a database. We also said we're going to be looking at the ProQuest and uh, as many databases as possible. So which make it easy for anyone to replicate if they're doing a similar type of review. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, so once you've done that, um, in terms of identifying relevant articles, there are useful tips that you can also adopt. Again, you might want to um, use this um, comparator. So for example, you might want to use the AND as a comparator. You might, for example, how that would work would be reintegration and former terrorists. That could be a way of um, designing a search term that would help you restrict the number of studies to those type of research. So you not get then uh, lots of research that are not relevant to your review. So it does save time when you draft your inclusion criteria using these specific words and or and then not as well. Okay, so for the fourth and um, fifth stage, um, the reason I combine them together, because in actual reality, I and my team tend to do both together. So for example, we look at the abstract, the title, and the full paper. So if we look at the abstract and database, so yeah, examples of database, web of science, EBSCO, international bibliography of the social sciences, to mention but a few. So if we look at papers meeting our inclusion criteria, we can skim through the abstract to see if actually this paper meets the criteria. And if it does, we go through the data extraction as we proceed. So for some team, like I said, they might decide to do first the, um, the abstract and then download the relevant paper. Then at another time, they sort of extract the data from the paper. But what we do in my team is that we do both as we go. And then this is where Excel becomes important as a way of recording all of the findings that you've got. So for example, let's say you search the web of science for a specific, um, using a search, specific search word. And when you enter that search, you got like 1,500 returns. Excel, you can, you can record that on Excel so that when you're writing the actual systematic review, you can then say, we had X, Y, Z number of returns, but after sifting through the paper, only X, Y, Z, A, B, C met the inclusion criteria. Because with a systematic review, you're not just accounting for the studies that you included, but you're also accounting for the studies that you did not include, because that's the way you avoid bias as to why the other studies were not included. Okay, so this is the um, Prisma flow diagram that you would typically use to account for both the studies that you've searched, the ones you've, you've included, and the ones you've not included. So from that diagram, you would see that there is a column that tells you um, why you, you that tell that gives you a sense of you providing a reason as to why you excluded the studies. So again, you need to give reasons. So for example, one of the reasons could be the studies did not meet your inclusion criteria, or that the studies did not meet the caps criteria of quality or things like that. So it's about balancing and being transparent about what you included and why, and what you did not include and why as well. Okay, so the next stage, which is the sixth stage, is a data extraction. So this stage usually comes up when you've seen a study that meets your inclusion criteria. So here's an example of one of my published systematic review. 
of the data extraction table that I used. So from here, you could see that the paper is meeting my inclusion criteria, the aims of the paper, the populations are there, the methods that they used are there, the findings are there, the strengths and weaknesses of that specific paper are there. So I was really, really like transparent about the, the studies we included, why we included it, and um, the population and all of those information. So again, this is readily available. I'm just mindful of time. Um, and you can always go through them during your spare time. Okay, so let's say you're done with um, all of the data extraction. The next stage would be to, and then you've sort of looked at what the total number that meets your inclusion criteria as a result of that. So the next stage would be to engage in the quality assessment. So I tend to use the critical appraisal skills program to assess each of the papers that we include in our studies. Because what it does is that it's a 10 item um, question that helps you evaluate each paper that you've included to see if they meet the quality assessment threshold. So, for example, one of them is um, Was the recruitment strategy appropriate to the aims of the research? So, did the author report it? Um, we had the data collected in the way that addressed the research issues. Have ethical issues been taken into consideration? So those are things that are quality um, 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 assessment benchmark that we look at for each individual paper. So if a paper have not really met all of this quality threshold, it tells you, um, or majority of the quality threshold, then it does tell you about whether or not that paper is a viable study you could include in your research. And this is where systematic review becomes something that is sort of authoritative, given that it is taking into consideration all of these robust measures before including studies and making recommendation based on the studies that have been included. So um, again, um, the CAPS um, um, tool is available freely online. So when you're doing your systematic review, you can easily download it and use it whilst, of course, acknowledging the source, uh, as the case may be. So in terms of the next stage, then this is the actual data synthesis. So um, the synthesis is where you bring it all together. So let's say in total, you've got 20 studies or 25 studies that met your inclusion criteria. You've um, done the data extraction. How do you make sense of the study in terms of the dominant themes that are um, emerging from the study? Uh, you tend to get that in qualitative studies a lot, which dominate disciplines like terrorism studies, because there's very less quantitative studies using randomized control trials, as we've seen in our previous systematic review. So in that case, um, what I tend to encourage is that when you're synthesizing your studies that meet your inclusion criteria, it's worth organizing them from the context of, for example, the country of origin, that's if you're looking at more than one country, the population in, in, in focus, the type of interventions and some of the barriers and facilitators of that specific research. So for some research, they could tell you about the limitations that they face. So you might want to look at that as, again, a way of organizing the sentences and reporting them in your um, in your study as well. Again, um, there's also the issue of robustness, which is um, important as well. And for you to ensure robustness, you might want to look at it from two main perspective or two main elements. So the methodological quality, and that is what the CAPS tool help you do, because by the time you've gone through that quality assessment check, you can be able to make an informed decision as to whether a specific study is methodologically robust. And then it's also about the, the trustworthiness of the synthesis product. So how are you synthesizing the study? How many researchers have looked at that study with you? And how did you resolve any disagreement? So for example, in my team, which um, used to be on, on average between three to eight, and like I said, 15 for other teams I've worked in in the past, we do set it up in such a way that if there's a disagreement between me and another scholar, we call a third neutral scholar within the team to look at the paper and then they make a decision on it. So that's a trustworthiness to give it more credibility when it comes to how we arrived at the papers that we eventually are reported in the systematic review. Okay, 
So um, in producing the synthesis, it all depends on the type of studies you've been included. So if you've got quantitative studies as well, then you might want to report it using some statistical analysis. However, if you've got just qualitative studies in your review, you might want to do it thematic uh, thematically, which um, in a sense also works as well. So here's an example of one of my published review where we use a thematic approach to synthesize the, the, the key studies that met our inclusion criteria. And the reason we did this was because within the context of the terrorism studies in which the review is based, we couldn't find at the time of the specific review any studies that used randomized control trial or experimental design. So what we found was majority, 99.9% qualitative study. So that's why we then use a qualitative synthesis using thematic analysis. So you could see from that specific synthesis that we're clear of the number of studies that reflects that specific theme and we listed all of the studies. So if you want to sort of follow up on that, you could always go and read the studies where the, that specific theme um, resonates quite strongly across that specific literature. So it's um, a useful way of producing the synthesis in a logical manner. So you're doing it thematically and that allows for a flow as well. Okay, so in terms of interpretation of the results, which is the ninth stage, meaning you're about to wind up the review, um, there are um, a number of questions that it's encouraged to think about when you're actually writing this specific session. So for example, how comprehensive was your search? So did you just search like um, scientific database like Web of Science? And if that's the case, why didn't you search other areas like um, textbooks or journal article reference lists or the library? So all of that would inform how you would interpret the results. So for example, if you've only searched EBSCO, then you, it might not be appropriate to make claims that that was the overall study you found because there might be other studies in Web of, uh, of, Web of, Web of Science or the international bibliography of the social science, meaning the review is not as robust to make authoritative claims, if you get what I mean. So it's really, really important to bear that in mind when you're interpreting the results as well. And was quality assessment done? So I have seen some review where there was no quality assessment statement for each of the papers. So you might find that when you're looking at other reviews. But I tend to include that in my review because it's really important and it's also in line with global best practice. So if there's no quality assessment done, what does that tell you? How was paper evaluated to make sure they meet the quality threshold in line with global best practice? So that would definitely sort of weigh in on how likely you're going to take those results seriously when reading those type of review. But it's quite, there might be an explanation as to why that is not included. That's not to say the review is not good, but it's just encouraged to include that as well to make it more robust and to increase the quality of the review. Um, was publication bias evaluated? Again, that's really important in terms of the type of studies you're including. Um, how do you manage for publication bias to ensure that lots and lots of studies were included? So for example, it could be bias of English language. There are some reviews that would say we only include studies that are uh, that we're in English language. So how do you account for studies that we're not in English language that might be relevant for your review? There might be an explanation why it could be because they don't have access to interpreter, they've not got funding for translation and things like that. So again, that could be something that needs to be bear in mind when writing your systematic review whilst also providing a justification as to why that is the case. So there is a number of things to think about. And again, another aspect is the implication of the systematic review. So having done all of this robust work, what does it mean? What can we take out of it based on the synthesis you've done? So what have we learned as a result of your synthesis of all of the literatures that you've done? What can policymakers take out of it? Or what can we take out of it from the context of the knowledge as a result of that synthesis? So it's about giving us a clear direction of what the current state of the evidence is and what we can take out of that to the next stage as the case may be. So it's really, really important that um, 
And it's also encouraged that um, one includes that implications of the systematic review, because that would give us a sense of, okay, this has been done so far, okay, this is the next step. And then that sort of build upon existing knowledge rather than regurgitating the same thing that have been done before. So that's really, really important as well. And then finally is the recommendation. So um, again, this is debatable. For some, they would say, oh, it's not really key to, but I always tend to include a recommendation in my systematic review because having gone through all of that, so what is the recommendations that we can take out of that, that we can take forward as a result of the work that have been done so far? That's where you sort of make recommendation. And again, that's where you sort of talk about strengths and limitations of the systematic review, because there is no perfect systematic review. There might be, for example, um, a review that looked at a specific time frame. So it could be for the last 10 years. So what then happens to studies after the last 10 years? So that's already a limitation because you're only looking at a specific time frame. So all of that is also important to include and as well as a recommendation that we can take forward having conducted that piece of work. And then the conclusion, what the key findings are, what that means, as well as how we can improve or uh, not just improve, but how we can sort of be able to take forward the key message from that systematic review. So what I would say in conclusion is that um, a systematic review does represent um, a useful way for synthesizing existing studies. And it's also useful, again, if you're thinking about originality, it's very, very easy to demonstrate originality, especially for PhD students, when doing systematic review to say, this is what we've done, and this is where my work sits in with the existing body of literature. And not just for PhD students as well. Even me as a researcher, I tend to, before I go into any new topic area, I tend to start off with a systematic review first because I really want to understand the key um, debates in that specific area to know what is actually there, the interventions that are there, what have been done and what can be done differently. So it's a very useful way of synthesizing existing studies in a way that is methodologically rigorous, in a way that could be replicated and in a way that is very transparent as well. And it's also useful for policy recommendations as well. So um, we've been seeing an increasing trend in policymakers relying on systematic review evidence as a basis for informing their policies. So in the past, I've done a rapid evidence assessment um, with senior colleagues where it's been used to inform the UK government white paper. So it's a very useful way of sort of synthesizing um, all of the evidence that are there, and then using that to inform policymakers to say, this is the evidence that are there, this is what they're saying, and this is a way forward. Um, I actually intended it to be 45 minutes, but it seems I've run along. So yeah, some selected references. And um, any questions so far? Well, if you've got any question, you can always drop me an email because I, I just noticed that I've run five minutes past the time, my apologies. Um, you can always drop me an email on c.ike at c.ac.uk if, if I'm unable to answer it straight away, yeah, because of time.